So, Father in heaven, thank you uh, for the, the beauty of this day. Literally, the sun is shining and uh, uh, reminds us that we would but ponder it of the light of Christ in our heart. Um, we thank you, O oh God, for our salvation and for you uh, giving us uh, the grace and mercy to get up and get in here at 930 this morning so we can study your word. Father, we'd ask that you would make this uh, short 40 minutes profitable for our soul, uh, that it would be a blessing to us, and that it would grow us in our love for Christ and in our, our obedience to him. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 So, Minister of Book, I only have two extra, and then I see Donna doesn't have one. If you'd like one, I can get one for you. Okay. Would you like one? Yep, yeah, I'm sorry, I, don't, I only have two extra. Uh, but I'll get you another one. I don't come that often, so she can have mine. I'll pay for it. No. No. Okay. Yeah, no, they're gross. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, who, has everybody got a book that wants a book? That's the way to put it. Has everybody got a book that wants a book? Yeah, I, I left mine. Would you like a book? Silly. I love mine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, grabbed mine. I grabbed mine. I grabbed this book. I see an eye. I look so. No, I get it. I got, we, we got away. We got a method here. <laughs> so, uh, I'll order a Probably people aren't here, so I'll get a few more. And uh, do you come through here through the week? I'll have them in a couple of days. Yeah, probably. I'll put it in a box. When I go, I'll put it in a box. For anybody else. But uh, there you go. So books, you know, they're good. Now today we're on, if you turn to the table of contents, still an administrative. You know, last week I, I covered the section on a new identity you see there. You know, so each, each bold heading, a new identity, a righteous stain for God, love by the ministry of Trinity, those are blessings, right? And then there's uh, four or five um, uh, smaller chapters, if you will, uh, that uh, comprise our message or our lesson today. Do you want to look? No, I have one. Do you have one? Yeah. Okay, very good. So, last week we talked about uh, um, our identity. I want to cut, hit that one more time. Our identity, a new identity. We, we came about a new identity upon being regenerated, uh, being, and becoming aware of through faith and repentance of our identity of being in Christ. And we mentioned... Um, um, or we talked a little bit about how this book walks us through three dimensions of our identity in Christ, that of being a saint, that of being a sinner, and that of being um, a sufferer. And um, I just want us to keep in view that I think the author's intent, if I can get a straight hit, is not that we're, you know, we're all those at one time. I guess that's where I want to say it, it, we're all, we're, we are all saints, we are all sinners, we are all sufferers at one moment, at every moment. He's breaking them up so we can study them. You know, we're going to look at six lessons as us as a saint, six lessons as us as a sufferer, as a, as a, as a sinner, and then as a sufferer. So, so it's not that, you know, we're... We're a saint for a while, then you know. I mean, he wants us to forget about that. He's building on all, he's, he's building on the whole thing as he goes along the book. So I don't know if that came across real well last week or not. Maybe I've just maybe it was real well and I just ruined it. I don't know. So uh, um, there you go. And, and we're focused on on our being a saint. Um, in today's lesson. Uh, is about our righteous standing uh, before God. Uh, the first point is that you are justified by God in before God. Um, the, the passage there, worthy of memory, memorizing 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, you know, in, in great military fashion, we're making our main point first, and we're going to make sure we make the main point the main point. 
you know, that we are justified. We stand. We, we didn't make ourselves justified. God declared us justified. And um, we may experience doubts. We may say I'm confused by it. We may be sorrowful for sin and say, how could I possibly be justified? And we have some misunderstanding and we have we experience guilt and shame for sin, which we'll talk about. Um, but none of that changes the point that you are justified by God. You have, you are, you're justified. And that is the main point. If you get no other point, if I just bumble our way through here for the next 30 minutes, you know, you can walk out here not, I have a righteous standing. God himself has declared me justified. I am righteous before him. Okay? And you can put a period there and stop and go, I might feel bad about my sin. I might feel this, that, that. But, but nothing changes what God has done. You, right? You are justified. So, let's spend a few minutes just understanding justification again. You know, I've been hearing uh, all my Christian life about justification. You know, I remember the first time I didn't know what the heck that word meant. You know, uh, I use, you know, we use it in our language today, you know, I'm justified in doing that, you know, but it's not the sense that we use the word here, being justified, and uh, for almost 40 years now, you've been, uh, you know, being preached to and lessons and discussions about justification. We can't get enough learning about our justification, I'd say, you know, it, if, it, if nothing else, so that we can rejoice in our justification. We should, we should hear about it. So, let's talk about our justification. I've got there on your handout, I believe, uh, a, a, a definition from the Westminster Confession of Faith of what uh, justification is. Um, let me read. And then we'll, I have a few comments about it to kind of build our foundation for what follows. Uh, those whom God effectually calls, he also freely justifies. Not by infusing, key words here, not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins, by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone, nor by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness, but by imputing the obedience and satisfaction of Christ to them, they receiving and resting on him in his righteousness by faith, which faith they have not of themselves, it is the gift of God. And we could look to Romans 3, 21, if you would please, let's just see how did these guys get to that? Turn to Romans chapter 3. I'll read. Let's get there. Romans chapter 3. This is good stuff. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 25. I'll read it. And then I'm going to go to chapter 5, verse 1. Probably many of us hear that one. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Amen. And then 5.1, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that justification is a grace. It's a gift of God. We, uh, let, let's see what we learn about it from the confession of faith. Uh, what, what's the word infusing mean? I didn't look this particular word up, but it says uh, we're, we're justified not by infusing righteousness into them. What's infusion? Infusing. What, what do we think that might mean? Putting it into or filling with? Or? Yeah, Donna, Bruce, yeah. Putting it into him, right? It, like he poured some righteousness into us. And this says, no, I didn't have it. You know, it's, 
we, we didn't get turned into or filled up with righteousness. So we, we, we see that there. Um, um, it, it, in fact, teaches we're um, justified by because our sins have been pardoned in Christ, right? Um, but for Christ, but we're justified for Christ's sake alone. Um, then we come into this word imputing. What's I did look that one up. Imputing means to ascribe to someone a virtue of a similar quality in another, uh, and it's undeserved in a Christian sense. So, do you see the difference between imputing something and infusing something? Uh, the quality of the person, though. Look, there's a duck with a bunch of ducklings waddling along out there. <laughs> You'll see what I mean. Let them in. Is that what she said? <laughs> there's a big puddle over there, but she's heading for that. How many just We can probably make a Bible lesson out of that. <laughs> So when I'm imputed, when right when when, when something's imputed, I, I kind of think about though my what God thinks of me changed, what way He sees me change, but I didn't change. It was it was declared. I was declared righteous. It was imputed uh, because it was similar to a quality of someone else, that being Christ. Okay, His righteousness, the righteousness Christ possessed because He was sinless, was imputed. Credited is another word we hear. Credited to me. But I still did it. I was still a sinful creature. Right? But his righteousness has been credited to me, imputed to me. See the difference there? It's not that I became righteous and, and, all, and all that change. It's, it was credited in my account. But at the same time, our sin was imputed to him. Yeah. That's true. It had to go somewhere. And why did it have to go to him? He's perfect. Perfect. Right. It went to Christ because he's perfect. But there was a reason. God, can you say that? We're all good here. That sin I just won't think about. He did something with that sin. He imputed it to Christ. It Why did he impute it to Christ? It had to be dealt with. It couldn't just be buried. So Christ could take it and, and suffer the punishment for it, the so wrath of God for it, because it wouldn't be just. It wouldn't be just for God to just yeah. overlook that. It had to be dealt with. And he did deal with it in Christ. It was that big exchange, is the way I think about it in my hand. My, right, my, my sin for his righteousness, vice versa. And my sin went there, and he carried that. It was imputed to him like his righteousness was imputed to me. It was imputed to him, and he took it to the cross and suffered God's wrath. For, that's some kind of wrath. Okay. So let's look. I think in your worksheet we talked about... Upon our justification uh, flow graces. There's things that have, we're justified, you know, because of faith. Um, and from, from that flow adoption and sanctification. Let's, let, let's, let's look at Ephesians 1.5. And then if someone would look at, uh, be ready to read Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. And then we'll hear Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. And we'll just see which of these they're talking about. But these are the supports for what happens when we're just Ephesians 1 5. He predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. There we go. There's the idea of adoption being brought that Paul's introducing, you know. Um, we can't become children of God until we are able to be in the family of God, you know. So we were justified and then we become adopted. Romans chapter 6, verses 5 or seven, five through 7. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Through mm what? -hmm. Through seven. I think you got that. Mm -hmm. So you can see there that sense of, first of all, 
We're in Christ. You know, that, that idea is brought through there and reaffirmed. We're in the one who's in Christ. And the idea of that being in Christ, we are set aside, set apart, set away from sin, right? Sanctification. That's the idea. That's what sanctification is. We're being set apart and in that, that process of being conformed to the image of Christ is begun there. Once we've become justified, everything starts flowing out of that. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Spirit himself bears witness with the Spirit, with our spirit, that we are the children of God. And the children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. So we see the whole idea of adoption and sanctification together in that short passage. And you know, the, the Holy Spirit involved, so the, the three passages we've read, we've, you know, God the Father, the Son who, who redeemed us, and we are in involved in our sanctification in the Holy Spirit. It's God, the, the triune God who's working on us, and, and, and I think next week as we're listening, who loves us, okay? It's not as if God loves us and Jesus doesn't or something, you know? It's the triune God who who's, has saved us and uh, is working in our sanctification, working in concert with each other. Tracking? Okay. And from justification, because we're justified, flow good works. Let's just hammer that on in with these passages. John chapter 15, verse 8. Then someone would read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And then James chapter 2, verse 17. Where we've been saved to something. We've been justified. And from that flow adoption and sanctification. And there's a reason. Okay? We're saved to good works. Yeah. That's not the reason. It's all to glorify God with our lives. So, John chapter 15, verse 8. John 15, verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and to prove to be my disciples. And our fruit does something, too. It proves who we are. It's the outward sign, an outward element, an outward, it shows what's happened on the inside, comes out on the outside, right, is the fruit. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Very familiar passage to us. We're saved for a purpose. We're saved in Christ. We're set in Christ for good works that God is predestined just like us. He's predestined these good works. And they have a reason to glorify Christ. Uh, James chapter 2, verse 17. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. There will be good works that flow out of our life, not because we're good people, but because of him whom we belong to, because we're justified, we've been adopted into his family, we're being sanctified, and it, it will be natural, it will happen, that good works that glorify God will flow out of our life. And we can look at it, and this will, this will come across in many lessons, we can look at our life and be objective and go, well, what are the good works? Are there good works? Is, you know, and we can look at that and, and see how we're doing. Or, and, and, and is, is, is my life worship for, for Christ? You know, am I living my life that way? And it's... We can get morbid about that and go, well, I don't see anything, I'm worried, I'm scared. Well, I, I, I think if we would all look at our life, we'd see that there are, for the Christian, there are always good works that will flow from our life. But we, we need to look at it. Okay? My loss, we we'll lose everybody there. We're getting ready to run out of the room. We good? Sam, you with me? All right. So let's move on. Justification, and that is the main point. We are justified before God. Now we'll peel back a little bit, but if you check out from this point on, you've got the main point. So, because we're justified, because of our righteous standing before God, we are no longer condemned. 
Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. There is, now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can put a period there. Well, the Lord did put a period there. We are not condemned. All right? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we are in Christ Jesus. We are in him. It's mystical. It's kind of hard for us to grasp, but we are in him. There is no condemnation for us. For the law of spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now, so there's no condemnation. And we, as, as should be common for us, we, we, we look at our life and go, oh, great, great. Right? justified, uh, I'm adopted into the, into the family of God, I'm supposed to be getting sanctified, being conformed to the image of Christ, but when I look at my life, I see sin, I see where I've fallen short, I see where, wow, I'm not, I, I am not measuring up, when I, when I compare myself and my life to, to this person, uh, I, I, I don't see how this is working out. That maybe I'm not a Christian. We wrestle with sin a lot. Of I bet you, I hope that all of us here look introspectively and we wrestle uh, with sin. And I think that's a common, I don't think it's a bad thing for us to look and see sin in our life and go, uh oh, I don't like that. I, I want that to go away. I think it's common. Is that right? Is it here? Yeah. Um, what, why is that? Well, for one, Satan accuses us. Satan gets up in our ear and accuses us of sin. Say, look at yourself. You call yourself a Christian. Um, we can think about Job's experience in chapter 1. You know, he describes him uh, as uh, righteous before God. And Satan pranced on up to God and said, look at this guy. Man, you turn your back on him, he'll throw you out with bathwater. You know? Uh, he, Satan is, a, is our accuser. Revelations chapter 12, verse 10, if you were to turn there, it describes Satan as our accuser. And he accuses us before God. He accuses us to ourselves. You know, when, when, you, when you do that, look inside your, your spirit, your heart, and to see, well, wow, I can't believe I did that. You know? And Satan is telling you, yeah, you did. That's pretty cool. You know? I'm making your life miserable right now. You know, I always like to remind us, the battle's won. Christ is victorious over sin. We are in Christ. The victory's won. But Satan wants, while we're on earth, to make us as miserable Christian, as much a miserable Christian as he can. Right? He wants us to walk around sad. He wants us to walk around feeling guilty. He wants us to be bitter. To be angry with each other. To pan the fingers up. He wants to make us miserable Christians because we forget, right? And then we know Satan tempts us to sin. Uh, we know we are capable to justify our sins to try, in our own effort to make them go away. Well, I had every reason to get angry at her. You know, it's okay. You know, she deserved that. So what am I doing there? I'm trying to make sin go away, right? I don't, I don't want to think about that anymore, right? Uh, so we're trying to justify. So there's, there's all manner of way that we wrestle with sin in our life. And what's, what's, as we wrestle with sin, what's a common emotion or feeling that you get when you ponder your own sin? Anger. What do you, I heard something. Anger. We could get to anger. I'm looking for another answer, but we could get to anger. Despair. We often do. Despair. Despair, yeah. Bitterness. Shame. Right? Yeah. Now we're right where Satan wants us. Right? When we are, we look at it and we say, man, I am, I'm just falling short. I'm pat over there. I can't, I can't, I'm never going to be as good a Christian as him. And man, that just chaps me. You know? He's got it easy. He doesn't, he doesn't know how hard I've got it. It's not fair. You know? And, and what happened? I become bitter. And I get angry. I get angry. Pat, he didn't know what he did. I'm just angry. <laughs> You know? <laughs> and, and, and I become envious. It's coveting, right? I'm envious of what he's got and his calm and Christian demeanor. And 
accept your sin or give it excuses, then you can't be reading God's word because it's going to tell you that you're in sin. Yeah. You can't be praying because it's, you're going to be reminded of your sin and yeah. you need to confess. And then you won't want to go to church and then you start to neglect the fellowship. And so when sin creeps in and you try to give it excuses, you can't be in close fellowship with God. You can't be. You know, and I think that, that can yeah, happen when we wallow around it yeah. and, and not deal with it live in denial about it. You're right. We've got a broken fellowship and we have to notice it and do something to get out of that muck. Reading the word, forgiveness, repentance. Let's, let's, this, this is good. This leads us to our next point. Um, Satan would like us to sit in our sorrow and, and shame and never experience the joy of our salvation. Thus, this is what we need. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves. So how do we do that? How do we preach the gospel to ourselves? And how do we, when we notice that, bring ourselves back so that we stand in the reality of our justification before God? So let's let's pull it apart. I think I got Mark chapter 8, verse 33. What is that teaching us? But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. All right, okay. The Lord, realizing uh, that Peter's being tempted in his sitting, rebuked Satan. Okay? And I think many evangelical Christians don't want to deal with the reality that Satan exists. And Satan tempts us. And he's a real spiritual being who is out to harm us and make us miserable. We rebuke Satan. The same words of the Lord. Satan, get behind me. Get away from me. Go away. I rebuke you. Right? We might have to do it a hundred times today. Okay? But we rebuke Satan. Get behind me. I'm not going to listen to you. I know what you're doing right now. You are trying to make me miserable and sad and bitter and so on and so forth. You're trying to make me sin. And I may have sin, but we need to rebuke Satan. Go. Ahead. What's, what's remarkable about that passage is just moments earlier. Peter had declared, "You are the Son of God. Yeah. You are, you are Christ, the Son of the Living God." So it, it's not like we're uh, we can be at a place where that's not un, that's so unlikely to happen. Right. Um, I agree. We're just like Peter. Yeah. One moment we're hot for the Lord, the next we're cold for the Lord. Or, or it, well, actually, Peter's motivation was kind of good, you know. But he didn't. But that. he didn't discern. <clears throat> What, what the problem is, is what he's trying to do. He yeah. liked the discernment to sort it out. But the Lord did. And he teaches us with it now. To rebuke Satan. What's next? What, what, what's the next thing we're going to do so that we stand on the reality of our justification? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. What are we going to do? We're going to hold on to God that we might be able to stand the wiles of the devil. Sure, that's why you were here today. <laughs> And that passage there describes what that is and, and how we conduct spiritual warfare and how we, we, we rebuke Satan to go away, how we fight Satan, right? And then Romans chapter 8 1, what does it teach us to do? Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is, there is no, there, there is, therefore, no condemnation for those Memorize that passage. And when you're stuck in, in, in the 
miserableness of your sin and wonder, how could I have done that? Or something from your past comes back to your memory. How could I have done that? Or how could I do that again? This sin I thought I killed and moved on from, I just did again. Woe is me. Rebuke Satan. Put on the full armor of God and preach this verse to yourself. I am in Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And stand it. Okay. I might feel bad. Well, that's on me. I need to move away from that, right? I am justified before God. Right? As a child of God, he loves me. All right. So, let's... Um, you know, the last point, uh, there's consequences for sin. I want to speed up the clock here. There's consequences for sin, as we've all learned by now, I hope. There are consequences for sin. There's no punishment for sin. Right? We're clear on that here? The punishment was wrought on the Lord Jesus Christ up on that cross. The punishment for your sin, my sin, our sin, imputed to Christ, and Christ suffered the punishment for that sin. We don't get punished anymore. We do get corrected. We will endure discipline. The Lord will redirect us away from it. He'll work in our life to stop it and to kill it with us. So we shouldn't just accept sin. Sometimes, well, I'll never do that again. Well, they deserved it or whatever. You know, sometimes we don't take it serious enough. So that's, you know, that's a step I'd add there. There's consequences for sin, uh, never punishment, um, consequences like death, broken relationships, uh, broken relationship with God, broken relationships with family, there's depression, there's anxiety, there's all kinds of consequences for sin. Uh, so we shouldn't, when we see it, we shouldn't just roll past it and go, well, I won't do that, I'll be okay. Gotta get in there and kill that bad boy and deal with it. Uh, like we've just talked about, and seek forgiveness and, and repent. And then when we get to the part of, the, of our lessons about being a sinner, we're going to really pull apart repentance some. But that, that we don't, I just want to make that point. It's easy for us to just, I did that, but it's okay. No. Jot that down, come back to it in your prayer life that night, that morning, whenever it is, and confess it. Work it out. Repent. I, I'm, not only am I going to do it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that dude's got a, the sword of the spirit in it, man. Kill that. Right? Good? You, uh, we are unashamed in God's presence. Just real quick, because i got some good points I'd like to make at the end here. You, we're, we, we don't need to feel ashamed in God's presence. Psalm 34, 5. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. I, when I feel shame before God, and we will, we say, shame, shame probably broke right there. You know? But phew, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I need to put that away. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. God is not ashamed of us. We shouldn't be ashamed of ourselves, right? Christians, we've all got skeletons in our closets. Uh, we remember usually where we put them, and we feel shame. We should know. God knows where we put them, too. It's not a secret. All right? Confess it. Repent. Let's move away from that, right? Let's move away from that shame. Um, I think I've got some passages there. For you to look at on your own so that we can move forward a little bit uh, about our sin. Uh, but one thing I want to point out is there can be a good outcome from sin. Or uh, from, from shame, sin and shame. There can be a good outcome. Growth. Yeah. What could it be? Uh, Romans chapter 2 verse 4. Someone read that. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Out of our sin comes repentance. Out of our sin, 
we experience briefly, you know, we come, become aware of the sin, we feel guilty for sin, we admit we did it, and we seek repentance. We kill the sin and repent of it. There's the good thing, right? We're, we're, uh, we're moving along in our sanctification, right? So I want to make that point. Um, we can experience shame um, because Satan invents something. We have to look at it. Satan says, hey, look what you've done. Did I do that? Is it true, Satan? Uh, we can rebuke Satan. Uh, uh, we should. But Satan, being who he is, will torment us. Uh, and then it can come from others, from our brothers and sisters. Uh, our, our, it could be abuse. And that terrible uh, sin of someone abusing us, whether it's emotionally, spiritually, physically, right? I mean, we may experience shame, right? But that's when we got to look, well, should I? Is that appropriate? Is that, is that an appropriate emotion for me to experience shame for something I, I haven't done? I, it's, it's been thrust upon me. Christ experienced shame. He suffered because, and, and felt shame as, as he, he suffered. Uh, Shame that sin exists. Shame not because he sinned, but the being flesh and so forth. Uh, he, he, he felt it. He, and that's good because he can sympathize with us. Um, Christ knows our struggles and that we struggle with sin. The struggle shouldn't be confused with shame. We will struggle with shame. Struggle with sin. It's common for us to feel ashamed because we struggle with sin. That is part of our condition as Christians. We will struggle with sin. I don't think we should feel prolonged and deep shame. Right? It's part of the condition. We need to do things to move away from that moment of shame so that we can experience the joy of our salvation. Right? So let's not get lost between those two words, the struggle and the shame. We're a servant of God. I think that's point four, is it not? Um, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings, James chapter 1, verse 1. Um, my point in, in, in uh, 4, and I think the author makes this, the graces of adoption and sanctification lead us to becoming obedient. It creates in us a desire to be obedient. Right? I didn't necessarily want to be obedient to my father. I would be obedient because he would make me be obedient, whether I wanted to or not. Right? It was kind of ex it was external. Now, you know, so but I didn't it didn't work up within my heart that I, I I'm gonna be obedient because I love him, to be honest, right? I, mean, I love my dad, but that's not why I was obedient in the moment. Whereas the Holy Spirit because we're adopted and, and, and we were, we were being sanctified, that will lead us into loving Christ more and more, and out of that, we will be obedient because we love him more and more. See how the difference is there? Um, real quick about James. You know, the Lord's brother. James was the Lord's brother. But James never recognized Jesus as the Messiah while the Lord was alive. And you can look in John chapter 7, verse 5, or 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. Uh, I don't know if I put that on your worksheet or not, but there's two different places. There's reference to the Lord's brothers. Uh, there's reference to, to James being converted after the Lord uh, was, was uh, ascended. You know, it was all after that. Never while the Lord was alive did James recognize Christ as who he was. Yet you see in James chapter 1, James, who's now transformed, who's now a Christian, James writing this letter to Christians, James never claims the status of being, James, of being Jesus' brother. He never says, James, a brother of God. He never says that. He says, a servant of God. That's where he gets his status from, of being a, a servant. And that word servant goes back to the word doulos, uh, which I think he taught this one time about, you know, it's a slave, but slaves are a little different, you know, and we, we, the, the, the word slave now, uh, you know, we, uh, nobody in this room has been a slave. We, we don't understand slavery 
You know, we can't, there's a lot of biases there, there's a lot of history there, um, and, and we don't understand slavery practically because we, we've never experienced it, right? <clears throat> And when they talk, when Scripture talks about obedient servants, obedient <laughs> slaves, right? Slaves to Christ, slaves to light, select slaves. Uh, this obedience is a happy obedience. And so there's a difference here. This is not a slave who has to be beat to death or near death to be obedient. This is a slave who happily seeks to be obedient. Luke chapter 17, verse 10. <laughs> Real short, somebody near there? I can be there. Luke chapter 17, verse 10. 17 and 10? Yeah, you got that? So, so, go ahead. Okay. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our doing our duty. We are servants doing our duty. Our, our rejoicing in our salvation, our of uh, being happy slaves will grow and grow and grow as we become more and more obedient and then we become happy. You know, it's kind of a circle there, right? Um, obedience becomes our primary objective rather than a millstone holding us down. How can, a, how can obedience be a millstone that holds us back? When we do it because we have to, not because we want to. And what's that do? When we do it because... My dad's beating it into me. What, what's that generate within me? Huh? Anger. Anger. What else? Resentment. Resentment. Contempt. Yeah, contempt, bitterness, envy, all those things, right? And that's the law. And, <laughs> very good point. And that's what the law does. That doggone law. Man, it's beating it into me, right? Um... Yeah, millstone, that millstone of obedience can hold us back uh, and, and lead us. In, and there's Satan again. See, that doggone Jesus making me need to go to church on Sunday. You could be, be going to the Rays game at 1 o'clock, you know, with everybody else. You know? I hate them. Did I see how it works out? All right. Point five. We already possess every spiritual blessing. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And let's, use, let's quickly use this one to send us off in worship. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Spiritual blessings are ours here on earth, right? We enjoy spiritual blessings, material blessings. There's lots of blessings that we enjoy here on earth. And there's more in heaven that awaits. With every blessing is waiting in the heavenly places. Um, and we exist in Christ, who is right now in heaven. If you think about that for a minute, you, we exist here on earth. We exist in heaven right now, where the heavenly blessings are at. We exist in a real and actual way. This blows my mind, but we exist in a real and actual way in heaven, in Christ, at this moment. We transcend time and space right now. We live in eternity right now. Our minds can't grasp all that. One day it will. We'll see it. Oh, well, that's, that's a blessing, right? Uh, right now it's harvest, but we should try to wrestle that with it. Wow, I exist in a real and practical way in Christ, in heaven, beyond space and time, right now. What does that mean? What does that mean for me? Hmm. He understands us. We're blessed physically. We're blessed materially. He meets our biggest needs. Um, doesn't that give us meaning when we think about it? Doesn't that give your life some meaning that I'm, I'm on this earth, passing through, on to, on to heaven where, where I will be with my maker, Life's hard. It comes at us hard, but boy, it seems to... I, I, I will make it through this when we think about it, despite the suffering we have to go through. Right? We exist in Christ. You, you, and that comes through so many places in Scripture. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, 7, 13. Look at those on your own. Colossians 1, 17. All right? We have a righteous standing before God. We are justified. 
and because of the real and practical blessings that flow to us, we are children of God. We have a status. We have meaning. We have purpose on earth in, in eternity because we belong to God, right? And, we, and all things are held together by Christ, even us, right? We have status. We're free from slavery to sin and have become slaves, do us, slaves of righteousness. That's Romans 6, verse 18. I didn't invent that. The Lord did. Right? We, the Lord declared that in his word. We're no longer slaves of sin, but slaves of righteousness. Thus, because of that, we no longer have a reason to feel shame. Right? We, we will experience but we don't wallow in it. We move from it. Follow me? All right. If I aired here, is it comments, questions, criticisms? We need to get out of here. i got to go leave worship. We need to refresh ourselves and uh, so forth. All right? So next week, for those with the book, we look at Loved by the Trinity. I, I remember that correctly. We are loved by the Trinity. And we'll talk about that next week. So read through those uh, short chapters uh, in there in the coming week. Okay? Let me pray so we can go. Father in heaven, we are in awe and enthralled with the idea that we exist in the heavenly places right now. We transcend space and time. You have blessed us. Oh God, with being your children, with um, every blessing that there could be, uh, with your eternal care for our soul, uh, we are in awe of how much you love us, O oh Lord. And we'd ask now that you would drill that into our heart and make us understand it and be able to live it out in a practical way. Now, Father, please help us move from here across the way to worship, uh, clear our minds, let us refresh ourselves so that we can come before you and worship well. And it's in Christ's name we pray.